are significant, starting with this uh, uh, theophany that that theophany like uh, encounter with Moses and 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 uh, you know uh, the divine name and but right. Exodus 15 is probably the heart of uh, the, the real core of of this book and right. Um, some have said that this this you know we we have creation in the book of Genesis, but we're now in the idea of nation building. We're we're creating right. the Israelite people. Right. But how do you how do you see echoes of the creation story in in Exodus in general and and chapter fifteen in, in particular? Yeah. So I, I would almost say the, the reverse of what you just asked there. That that if you look at this story. You know, and you listen to this story, you see echoes of this story in the creation story. So, and so, the, so the say, resonant, so the structure comes from this, yeah, and it's retrofitted back into right uh, the exactly. Genesis account. Exactly. So, so to answer the question, we should remind what we said earlier in the course about the difference between a diachronic and a yeah. synchronic interpretation of of scripture. Right. That the synchronic is kind of we're taking the whole revelation as a package. And, and sort of interpreting it, you know, as, as one thing that we receive uh, in a particular time period. A diachronic one is where we're actually paying much more close attention to, like, the, the time periods in which the story came about. So, in other words, the, the various times in which the story, the, the, the various parts of the story came uh, to us in, in time. So, in other words, it's, it's treating the story of the whole Testament story, that is, or the whole Pentateuch like an archaeological site where the more recent events are kind of at the top and as you dig further and further down you get more to the to to the basis of like the, the very first uh, time in which 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 the whole thing kind of gets started almost all scholars think that Exodus 15 is the oldest part of right. of the Old Testament now this is you know this has implications though because I think a lot of times, most Christian readers and most Catholic readers will sort of default to the assumption, well, you know, you always write a book from the beginning to the middle to the end. So, so obviously, when the Bible was written down by the inspired human authors, author, authors, whoever, they're going to write the creation story in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 first because, well, that's you, you always start out, you know, do 1, 2, and 3 before you get to 4 and 5, and then you kind of build out from there. Well, in point of fact, you know, the, the story didn't quite come together that way. You have older parts of the story that, that are fitted in, and, you know, that, that, that are older than that. And later parts of the story that, that are later than that, even though they refer to an earlier, uh, you know, much earlier time period. Obviously, the creation of the world is, takes place well before the, the creation of Israel as a nation. But nevertheless, um, the creation of Israel as a nation is is almost certainly an older story in the version we have in the Bible than the creation of the world, and, and that's important. So again, this gets back to the difference between the history that is described in the text versus the history of the text. But right. I think if we're taking seriously this issue of the history of the text, this is a really important clue to how um, the ancient Israelite sort of religious theological mindset is, is kind of working in this period of time. Um, the, cre the fundamental creation story, if, if you're an ancient Israelite living, say, in the land, say, say in the reign of King David, the fundamental story is going to be, is, is going to be the Exodus story, uh, because the Exodus story is, is really the origin of you as a distinctive people, and it, you know, that, that inherited a distinctive land. And it's only after that kind of a story that you begin to ask questions, well, how is it that this land exists at all? In other words, how did God, you know, subdue the forces of water and the forces of, of, of chaos um, to, to create this land and give us safety and preservation in this land? But clearly, the, 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 the existence of, of, of Israel as a nation is, takes priority to that because the creation itself is not interested in creation the way we would be interested in it in terms of just the abstract world of how the question of how the material universe came about, the whole creation itself is, is tailored to the, the kind of question of Israel. How did this particular land 
come about which which we Israelites can live on in safety and preservation um, in, in a way of, of, of security and relative harmony um, and, and protection sort of from the forces of, of, of death and chaos. And that's, that's really the essential question there. So this is, I think, very fascinating that, um, that, that the, the issue of creation should be this way. So we should think of really the creation of the world and the creation of Israel, not as two different events at all, but almost as being two different sides of the same coin. Um, that the creation of Israel, and, and I think Warhol does an excellent job of bringing this out, that the creation of Israel, it, you know, is very much talking about how God, you know, overcame chaos in right. the context of the Exodus, right? You're, you're beating back water in the yeah. Exodus. You're, you're, uh, you're beating back to home. You're, you're yes, not you're beating be, back. Exactly. I am. Yeah. Exactly. yeah and, exactly. and the wilderness is itself a kind of a chaos. Yeah. So, so you're, you're sort of defeating that as well. You're defeating serpents as well. That that comes yeah. up in, in the numbers narratives. So all of these things are, are different ways in which we can see that that you know the fundamental creation is 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 in terms of, of Israel. And and so naturally the creation of the world itself is going to involve all of these things as well, right? Uh, so so I think that that's I think that that's really a, a, an interesting way of of thinking about it. And I I would encourage all students to kind of think in these terms. And you can indeed see this in a lot of different ways. Um, you can see this. Um, one way I, I would direct to see it is, is, is the Sabbath itself, right? There's, yeah. there's actually two commands. There's actually two places where the Ten Commandments are given, as, as we know or should know. Exodus 20 is one of them, and Deuteronomy 5 is the other one. There are a lot of differences between these uh, lists of, of commandments, but one specific one is, is probably the one that really stands out like a sore thumb. Sabbath. And that is yeah. the, the rationale for the Sabbath. Why yeah. do we have a Sabbath? Why did God command that, that there should be a Sabbath that should be commanded to make holy? And there's, there's two traditions given on that, and both of them are very telling. The one tradition, as you know, Rick, is the priestly tradition, which gets to, well, remember, God himself rested on the seventh day, and that's when he created the world. And that's why we, Israelites must also rest on the seventh day in imitation by God who created the world. But there's a parallel tradition in Deuteronomy 5, and that's about God freeing Israel from slavery, right? We think of these as two different things. They're not two different things. They're two different sides of the same coin, because the freeing of Israel from slavery in Egypt is, is a in creation. Sense, yeah. It is a creation, right? Exactly. And that, that's why we take off on the Sabbath day, because we're not slaves anymore because of what Yahweh has done for us. He's created us as a nation. He's liberated us from Egyptian slavery. And so, you know, we don't, <laughs> we, we don't have our factories clank around seven days like the Egyptians and like the Babylonians and all the other peoples. We take off one day a week to, to really pay homage to the fact that we are, we are a free people, right? Uh, we're, we're not, we're not slaves anymore because Yahweh has created us as a, as a free nation in a way. He's redeemed us. Um, the, the concept of redemption, that is to purchase a people from slavery, is first announced in uh, Exodus 15, in the, uh, in, in the story of, the, um, of, of God's freeing uh, Egypt or Israel from Egyptian slavery. So very, very important concept there. Um, so, so uh, yeah, I, I think this is really, really fascinating, though, in terms of how um, the, the, the idea of creation can, can really be understood in a much, much bigger and holistic way. Um, and, I, and I think that this is a, a definitely a way that we, we need to recover uh, as, as Catholic readers of this. Does the, um, does the theme of liberation that from, from slavery, just to, to camp on that, um, do you think this situates the... Uh, the assembly of these documents during the Israelite monarchy, or do you believe that perhaps like with Brueggemann and some others who see this in either an exilic or a post-exilic uh, yeah. realm that, okay, well, we're in Babylon, we're in Assyria. Right. This right. is just like right. where we are in, in Egypt. And it resonates with that. Or I mean, it's, yeah. it's yeah. really hard that's to a, pin it down. Yeah. That's a, that's a great question, um, Rick, because, 
you know, the the um the, the whole concept of Exodus, right, is 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 just like creation itself, it's sort of multifaceted. Yeah. Um there is an exodus from Egypt, but but it is no accident that um at the time of the exile that that the that God's promised return from the great diaspora that happens as a result of the Babylonian uh, invasion and conquest of Israel in 587 BC, that that this promise of of ultimate return is described in very much of of an exodus like language right yeah. where in isaiah for sure yeah exactly exactly and and so um it, it it's it's almost like you could say that the promise of ending the exile is very much of a new exodus sort of a yeah. of, of, of a tradition and it is um it, it is to be sure that uh, th this new exodus is going to be just very much described in terms reminiscent of, of the first exodus. And it, it might also be the other way around, too, that um, that the two stories sort of feed off of each other and that the original exodus and some of the later texts that describe the original exodus are going to do it in ways that, that specifically anticipate the exodus that's more relevant in the time period in which it's being described. So, um, so, so you have you have in a way two traditions that are very very difficult uh, for us to to sort of disentangle uh, historically. Um, yeah. I, they are two different events, but they're described as in, in ways as as being sort of um, mutually interpreting uh, e each other. And I think um, I think you can see this as well, and just even the calling of Abraham, right? So, so that you know the calling of Abraham. It's it's no mistake that Abraham is called from Babylon, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, uh, or the Chaldees literally is Babylon, and in fact, you know, Chaldea is the much later name of the place that that takes on a resonance of being relevant to a people that's already dealing with exile at the hands of these uh, Chaldeans. So, um, the Abraham story it's itself, you know, rem, you know, it, it is told in ways that are. Um, you know, reflected of of also later theological concerns, and and this is, I think, in in a way, what we need to recognize is that there, there's there's an underlying history to all these texts, but nevertheless, the way we're receiving them is with a, a very heavy theological overlay, in which um, the, the the sort of theological meaning, the sacred meaning, is is being brought out, and in which later events foreshadow. Earlier events foreshadow later events. Later events are reminiscent of earlier events. Um, this whole idea of typology, but but it's like typology yeah. on steroids because you're you're almost really, uh, you know, drawing out you know huge historical patterns in the way in the way God uh, deals with with people um, for, from earlier times to later times. Yeah, and it's it's easy to get stuck in a linearity. Uh, right. starting in Genesis and working your way through. Um, and it's obviously the intentionality of the the final redaction version, whatever you call right. it, uh, right. to walk us through from literally point A to point B. But understanding yeah. the yeah. histories of the text. I think the other, the other mistake that I know I've made is thinking that, okay, there has to be just one big idea in this book. And we have... We have liberation, we have law, right. we have right. the revelation of God is God's presence. I mean, those are all, you know, the the wonderful thing about the Catholic faith is it's never either or. Right. There is right. a both and yeah. sense of that. And Exodus is filled with these right. themes that continue to resonate in the church today. That, oh, yeah. Um, you know, that uh, although I, I grew up in South America where the idea of liberation got um, got confused with yeah, some guys yeah. from Cuba, and, oh, yeah, uh, and, yeah. and and which was which was kind of problematic. Yeah. Um, yeah, I you know I I, don't, I definitely don't want to try to un, untangle that one. But right, uh, well, well, I, I I'm glad you mentioned that, Rick, because because you know liberation theology is is really kind of coming back in a big way in, in North America uh, under the name of practical theology, but it's 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 very much working a lot of the same principles. It's important to remember that when we speak of, of liberation, uh, liberation is a theme that comes up in the Bible, but the much, much more common word is redemption. 
Um, yeah. and, and that is that that is the idea of uh, a freeing from slavery, not um, liberation in the sense that that um, uh, liberation theology typically will envision um, God's relationship to, to to the people. They're not exactly uh, liberated as they are um, bought with a price, right? So, so redemption is the idea of bought with a price, but, but you now are bought with you know, now allegiance to the new owner, the person who's purchased you, who is right. God and Christ himself, but they've not purchased you to do whatever the heck you want to do, right? It's yeah. it's not it's not liberation in that it's regard. Not, it's, yeah, it's, it's not anarchy. It's, what we talked about earlier about the structure that that you have priesthood, you have delegation of right. authority and right. um, leadership that is um, that is shared, and it's not okay, guys, what do you want to do today? Right, um, right, which, exactly. Which is unfortunately exactly. what happens. Exactly, so, well, so exactly, things, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so there, there's no greater, you know, Paul, you know, frequently, of course, believes very big time in redemption, but will always talk of himself as a, a servant of Christ. Literally, the word in the Greek is a slave of Christ, right? He, he's yeah, now... Philos. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So, so um, th- this idea of slavery to Christ is is paradoxical because Paul also speaks of, the idea of freedom for, you know, for freedom, God has, has made us free. There is no greater freedom than in being a slave to Christ. And that, those are the, that's the paradox that you have to sort of keep balanced in in your mind. But it's, yeah, it's not a a, a kind of a liberation in the sense that comes out of a, of a, of a dialectical theology where, you you know, you're, you're in effect finding liberation from someone who's wielding a, a theory that's designed to oppress you. I mean, that's, um, that's an idea that I think has a very, very limited purchase in uh, in in the Catholic tradition. Yeah, um, but, and, and in the past century, um, if, yeah. we, if we want to get yeah, specific. Right. Well, I'm I'm glad, Pete. Neither of you, neither you or I, are running for elective office, so we're yeah, not right. going to have to get <laughs> yeah, any exactly. deeper than, than we are there. Right. This has been right. great, Pete. Thank yeah, you so yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. Hey, thanks a lot. And we'll talk soon. Let's do it. Bye, bye now. Bye. Thank you.